Well, bonjour. Good afternoon. Uh, so nice of you to uh, have invited us here. I know many of you. And um, I am Joy Shelby. I'm the federally recognized tribal extension uh, educator, which is a unique position uh, within the 4-H program area. I've also been a part of the community food systems team for many years. And it is really nice to, um, to be here with a dear friend and, and representative of our, uh, of our region of the state. Um, I live in Ojibwe country. I am a non-native woman who is um, in a position to uh, connect children in the Bad River community with uh, their traditional food stories, uh, skills, um, and practice. And really, <clears throat> Sandy is uh, one of the people that I would uh, seek out and have to help children um, rekindle that part of who they are. So uh, really, um, I'm going to stop talking for as long as I can, as long as I can, I guess. And, um, and I'm here for questions uh, about regarding my position, so maybe we can do a little bit more discussion about my role. I will um, pass the mic now to my dear friend and an amazing woman, Sandy Goki, here with her daughter. She will introduce herself and tell you a little bit more about herself as well. So you ready for the mic? The real star of the show, of course, is Allie Jean, the little baby. So. <laughs> She's snoozing. Is right here okay? Sound all right? Okay. I don't care. Snoozing. Um, I just introduced myself in my language, Ojibwe Moon. I, I'm Sandy, I'm Bear Clan, and I, I come from Red Cliff. I live in Ashland, Wisconsin now. Um, <clears throat> I only know a little bit, and um, honored to be here, but um, I'm going to kind of start from way back, um, before time as we know it is, if that makes sense to you guys. Um, we were given gifts from the Creator, and it was a same as one of them, tobacco, and that's what's to be used it's one of our tools to use to speak with the spirits and the creator and the beings around us. And we, um, we always have it because anytime we take the life of something, the cedar, which is another one of our sacred medicines, it's mostly a woman's medicine. Um, our sage here and Here's some unbraided sweet grass and some braided sweet grass. So uh, if you guys want to, I'll pass these around. And um, part of, a big part of who we are as a people is we eat. Everybody does. That's what connects us as human beings. We eat, we drink, and Long ago, things were a little easier to get, and we have we have a lot of stories that talk about this. Um, but we got lazy, so I, the snow is not on the ground right now, so I can't really go in depth with a lot of the stories. But um, the morals of them, I can tell you. So, with our maple trees, they used to when you'd put your tap in here made out of sumac in the beginning now we have metal and plastic ones um, when you would do that it used to come out as syrup you didn't have to render it down so after a while people stopped working for it and they would just get lazy and they'd tap in the spile and just lay there mm -hmm. they started getting fat <laughs> not doing the rest of the work that needed to be done for the rest of the year. So yeah, they had maple syrup in the spring, but they weren't working for it. They weren't gathering wood. They weren't making the fires, staying up late, boiling it down, 
laughing, joking, visiting. That's all a part of the work too. It sounds like it's just being, being kind of lazy, but it's not, you know. Um, so then it rained and it rained and it rained and it rained. And those maple trees filled up with water and that's never stopped. So now instead of maple syrup coming out, we have sap and you have to work for it. You have to boil it, you have to tap it, haul it, store it, and, um, and then can it, jar it, so it doesn't go rotten or render it down to um, sugar cakes or sugar itself. So it might sound like I'm bouncing all over here, but there's a method to my madness. Um, that's, that's the beginning of our year. Um, springtime is our New Year's. That's when everything wakes up, shakes off the cobwebs, um, shakes off the snow, starts budding. So, at the beginning of the year, the first thing we do is we gather maple syrup, and the time when you do that is when there's a little ring around the base of a maple tree from it being above freezing during the day and below freezing at night. So then, once, um, once the trees start budding, leaves start coming up, that's when we move into um, spearing season, spring spearing. And old days you used to have a torch made out of birch bark. I don't have too much, just a couple of pieces here, but um, this is really good kindling and makes real good torches. So you'd have somebody holding a torch. And this is a winter spear. And a spring spear is 12 to 18 feet long. And you're standing up and used to stand in the canoe. So you'd have to be pretty steady and good on your feet. And you'd use that torch and you can see the walleye's eyes. You just drop it in and you jab it and put it in. Uh, winter spearing is a lot different than that, but we'll get to it. Um, now we have um, a lot of people use hard hats, but with the more technology and brighter, more lightweight lights, you can use them headlamps that they have, the elastic band. Those are bright enough to where you can see it. And we use boats now, um, aluminum boats generally, some are fiberglass. And we get a lot of criticism for doing that. Our, our rights weren't always recognized. We've always had them since the beginning of time. That was, that's our right from the Creator. You have that right too, every single one of you. It's, it's just that it's regulated by the powers that be. You, you, you all have that right to feed yourself and do it how you need to do it. We, um, we were thrown in jail for a long time um, over just that, is the way we have fed ourselves for generations and generations. And this just stopped um, probably 30 years ago uh, with the LCO v. Wisconsin cases. And that's where our treaty rights were reaffirmed in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and it was a really hard time in northern Wisconsin. Um, a lot of racism has always been there, still is there. But it came to the surface and it came. We were met with a lot of violence. Um, I wasn't alive then, but my dad was, my uncles, cousins. <laughs> They all went through that so that I can do it and my sons and my daughter can do it um, forever uh, because that's who we are as Anishinaabe people. Um, so after spring spearing, some people trap and that kind of coincides. It's once the inland lakes open up and trap for beaver, otter, and you can cook beaver. I'm horrible at it. Personally, I am horrible at cooking beaver. 
Um, I know some of them grandmas who can cook it real good, uh, but that that is not one of my skill sets. I can I know how to trap them with my husband, but I can cook deer meat like nothing else, but uh, not beaver. There's glands all over them that you need to know where they're at and you need to know how to take them out. Otherwise, your meat is going to smell and taste like beaver. Um, then summertime comes, there's an abundance of berries, fruit, um, different kinds of roots. We, I like coffee, that's my favorite drink, but we're people of that make tea and there are so many plants like in that book there that's being passed around um, there are so many plants we use for teas and that would be our regular drink and it would give us the nutrition we need and the vitamins and um, other substances we need to be strong be connected and survive in the climate we live in so um, I always try to think of my favorite berry and I can never do it because when it's the time of those wild berries that one's my favorite <laughs> but then when it's the time of the next one you know strawberries come and um, and then you get blueberries and raspberries and thimbleberries and I just can't decide I, I love them and and I think that might have to do with me being bear clan I don't know <laughs> but um then we're starting to get to late summer and one of our main staple foods is manumen and there's some in here mind if i pass this all right so there's some sage in here um some corn and then on the one closest to the handle is manumen or wild rice and we still use canoes for wild rice we still pull um, 12 foot pole, you're standing up and depends on how you want to do it, back or the front of the canoe. Um, it's kind of a teamwork effort. It is very much a teamwork effort, actually. And um, my husband likes to stand in the back of the canoe and I'll be in the front and we'll be facing each other. So the rice is coming at my back and I take one and I pull it all in and I tap it twice tap it sometimes three depends on how it's falling and how thick it is um, these are uh, called Bawa Iganuk Un Bawa Iganuk is one Bawa Iganuk Un two two knocking, knockers or racing sticks um, I made these they're made out of cedar they're really light um, they fit my hands well I have kind of small hands. Some people's are thicker. Um, there's, as far as our regulations go, um, I'm going to go back to this LCO case that I was talking about before. What manifested from that was our reaffirmed treaty rights. And like I mentioned before, they're reaffirmed. They weren't given to us. We retain them. And um, our way of being we think about every everything we do how it's going to affect seven generations ahead of us and um you know generally it a generation is about 20 years you know is how we we would think of it but it's actually a little longer than that it's probably about 40 years and so to think that far ahead on what you're doing it's it's really humbling and it's also a way of knowing that um, that what you do does affect the future and it does affect how how others will live and the quality of their lives so um, when you're racing it's it's hard work it's hot it's itchy you got bugs worms um, gotta have your hair in a braid if you have long hair otherwise you are gonna have rice kernels in your hair for days um, tuck your 
tuck your pants in your socks. Rice worms do bite. So the process of going out is only part, part of the process of getting it. So before you go out, you need to make your knockers. You need to make your winnowing basket if that's how you're going to do it. Now we have machinery that, um, that can help with the process of rice. But the old way, um, a lot of people still do use that. And so you have to make your winnowing basket, which is made out of birch bark. It's about this big. You stand with your back to the wind and you shake the rice and it's got a lip so it comes right back in. If you do it right, lost a lot of, lost a lot of rice learning how to do that right. <laughs> um, you have to make moccasins for the person who's gonna be dancing it. And these practices truly are a family and community effort because when, you, when you're processing this rice, um, you need your paddle to scorch the rice. But this little one here would be perfect size to dance the rice. And you have a stick here where you can hold part of your weight if you're bigger than his size. Um, you are, you're six, all right. Six years old, yep, that's about the right time. And you can hold on to it and you dance the rice. You're standing in a, in a pit and you have the rice in there and you're dancing it. And that's to loosen the hulls up from it, but we need somebody his size so you don't break the rice. Um, so when you're all finished with that, then you fan it and then you pick it and you pick it and you pick it and you pick it and you pick it. And you pick it. Um, that's probably my favorite part actually because I get to sit there and feel, feel this finished product that um, I didn't create, but I did, I did work for it. And it is a lot of work. And that's part of what keeps us healthy, what keeps us strong. Um, so then you, from racing, you go into hunting season. And a lot of these seasons overlap. Um, Birch bark, I, I said I was gonna jump around, we're still in summer here. Um, birch bark comes when, when the wild roses are in bloom. That's the best time to, to take the bark from the trees because um, it pops right off. So if you make a slit in it and it starts peeling, that's when you know um, you can safely harvest it. And we, we use birch bark for, I can't tell you how many things, um, storing, cooking. Um, you can cook over an open fire with birch bark. Travel, canoes, um, lodges. And um, when the fireflies come out, that's, that's when it's okay to start hunting. And, um, hunting deer, that is. Uh, I don't hunt bear, I don't eat bear because they are my family, I'm bear clan. I, unless I'm starving, I can't, I can't do that. But um, this is about the only thing I brought that's in my deer harvesting arsenal because I didn't think you guys would appreciate a rifle and a hunting knife and <laughs> um, and some old muddy waders. <laughs> but this I use as my drag rope. Um, slip this around the deer's head after you get it. And you just pull, pull, drag it out. And I get a lot of help. My husband's a big guy. Um, he's a really good hunter too. And we, um, that's, that's our main food sources are rice and deer meat. And I'm not very good at preserving berries because I eat them. <laughs> um, and even though I am Bear Clan, 
and I can't eat bear, I can, I can use the medicines that come from it. Um, this right here is bear grease, and I do use it. Um, it's good for a lot of, a lot of things. Kind of stinks. If you want to check it out, open it, smell it, touch it. Um, but that is medicine, and all of these things I'm showing you here are sacred. All of these foods that we we eat are sacred. Um, and the land we live on is sacred. And that's that's a really packed word for a lot of um, Christianity. Seems like a very packed word. But it's just being for us. You're sacred. I'm sacred. These little ones especially are. Um, our elders as well. All these different beings who give us their lives, they are too. And they're to be respected. They're not to be wasted. And um, what we do to them and for them is what goes into us. It, it is very cyclical and that's our, our time, even our concept of time is cyclical. We, um, we talk about history like it was just yesterday and we talk about the future as if it's happening now. You know, that it, it's no clear definition. Um, so back to our harvesting here. After, uh, after winter, and this is just what I do. There's so much more food sources and ways of um, harvesting things that I don't even know about. Like I said, I just know this much. Um, when the ice forms over, we go ice fishing. We um, use rods and reels. We fish all summer. Um, but one of my favorite ways is spearing. This is a winter spear. And has this rope connected, you tie it to one of the poles. In um, old way, you'd kind of make a teepee. That's steel, so if it drops, it's gonna be low. <laughs> um, you, you make a teepee and you cover it with canvas, um, buckskin, you know, whatever, whatever you had at the time that would work to make it really dark inside. You lay blankets down on the ice and you have a hole about that big, that round, inside of the ice. And you're laying there, and I don't have a jig stick either with me, sorry guys. Um, you connect a string to this, and it's connected to a stick about that big. And all you do is, you jig it, jig stick. Um, and this little guy will swim around. This is a big one. I I don't use ones this big when I when I actually go because it's heavy. It, it's really heavy, but it swims around in a circle. It imitates a real fish. And you can lay there all day and not see anything. Um, that's why it's called fishing, not catching. But <laughs> but you have your spear next to you and you're laying face down on the ice jigging, and you'll see a muskie swim up or in from behind you, wherever they're coming from. And you gotta take into account for refraction too, so sometimes you miss. <laughs> and you take it and you throw it. And this is heavy. Um, so, they'll hit the fish. You have your rope connected so you can just pull it up. Whereas our spring spears, they have a wooden handle and a, a metal spearhead. So if you drop your spear, it floats. So, um, done that too. Uh, make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know. We learn from them, learn what to do differently. Um, so, do that. And the other thing we do in the winter time, you know, the days are really, really short, nights are long. 
Uh, it's cold. It's easy. It's easy to get into a sad, dark spot during that time. And it's kind of the time of rest, too. Um, in our spirits, there's, there's some who we don't say their name when the snow is not on the ground because they're working hard. You know, they're, they're doing what we should be doing um, to be living. All, all this work that it takes to provide and feed each other um, with nourishment and um, life, really, is what we're doing. Um, so we, we don't talk about them when the snow's not on the ground because when you're talking, telling a story about them, they listen. They stop and they listen to that story being told. So we don't want to get them kind of angry, like, what'd you take me away from work for this for? So in the wintertime, we tell our stories, creation, recreation, the story of the world and how it is, why it is, where it is, um, why animals look a certain way, why this plant help, why, why red willow's red. Um, would have been a lot easier if we would have had a normal fall and there was snow on the ground. Um, <laughs> I could tell you a lot of this, but I, I can't right now. Um, so that's about our year end. This, I realize I didn't say much about this. This is um, a Dickenoggin, and it's a cradle board. And I have not put her in here yet. Um, I don't know if I'm a worry wart because she's my only girl or what, but I think, okay, you're just a little too small. I'm just gonna cuddle you right now. But my son, my middle son, um, went in here quite a bit and actually I dragged a few deer out with him on my back um, in this. And um, it's, it's a way to keep them safe, warm, bundled up, and it really builds up their back and their leg muscles to stand in there. And you, whoops, I am so sorry. Um, because they're constantly flexing in there. They, they look like they can't move. They kind of look like a burrito. Um, and this has little dream catchers hanging. And that's what these holes are for. Dream catchers, little trinkets to hang. Because their arms don't always have to be in. Their arms can be out. And um, that's how, how we learn from when we're young, before we can walk. Um, this used to have a handle on it, <clears throat> but I took it off because I needed to tie a deer's legs together so I could drag it out because I didn't have my drag rope with me. Uh, so that used to be there, and you can hang them on a tree. So you hang the baby up on the tree, and they're watching you, um, observing everything. And that's how we raised our kids in the old days was they would watch, they would listen, they would they, they wouldn't be running around, getting into everything. They would be observing. So you learn from an early age how to do what you need to do. I don't know. Um, any questions, anybody? I have a question. Hmm. When you were talking about the beaver and if you break the glands or get the glands in there, so what does beaver taste like without the glands? Good. Like <laughs> I don't know. It tastes like um, it well cooked. No. <laughs> no, it's more, It, I'd say uh, not quite pork. Yeah. Um, it tastes like beaver. I don't know. <laughs> Chewy? Um, Depending on how you cook it, it's pretty tough. Uh, if you best way I've had it is in a slow cooker with onions and garlic and potatoes sitting next to it, and it cooked all day long, and it was it was pretty good. Not when I cooked it though. <laughs> I cooked it for a day and a half trying to get it loosened up, and it it was bad.